we gather for worship this morning, please take your hymnal and we'll turn to hymn 96, Unto the Hills, hymn 96. Let's lift our voices in praise to our God. confession, brothers and sisters, as we gather, as we look to the Lord our God to be our help, to be our keeper, to be our protector. And that is one of the great truths we confess as we come to in his, into His presence to worship Him as we do this Lord's Day, this morning and again this afternoon. A uh, welcome to all as we, as we gather to worship our God. And if you're visiting with us, a special welcome to you, and we pray you'll be blessed with us throughout our day. Uh, in our time together, and especially in our uh, public worship. Uh, a few notes just about today. Uh, we have this morning uh, in our uh, worship service, we'll, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper after the preaching of the Word. Uh, and uh, if you are visiting with us this morning, 
Um, you'll notice in the bulletin there's an insert uh, about the Lord's Supper at Covenanters. There are five uh, questions there. If you're able to affirm all five of those uh, questions, those statements, then you are uh, invited uh, to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. Um, and, uh, um, and if not, we'd ask you to let the, just the, the elements pass you by. We'll, um, and I'll say more about that when we come to the Lord's Supper. But take some time, even in the service, to, to, to look over those questions, and, um, and so you're able to participate in good conscience. Uh, and after the, the service this morning, as we have, uh, as we do every couple months here, uh, we have a fellowship meal, um, and uh, so, uh, again, all are welcome to participate in that, uh, including if you're visitors and you haven't, uh, it's okay if you haven't brought anything, you didn't know it was on, you you're just stay and enjoy our hospitality, and as we are able to be together in Christ and enjoy fellowship together and to, to, uh, to grow in those bonds in Christ. And so all are welcome to participate in that. So with the fellowship meal, we will not have, our, uh, we will not have Sunday school classes or sermon discussion this morning. Uh, but then again, as we conclude the service this morning, we we'll enjoy fellowship. Some stay throughout the day, and you're welcome to do that. Uh, but we'll meet again for worship at 4.30 um, and, uh, and listen to the Word of God through the prophet Micah this afternoon. Well, let's take a few moments now to prepare our hearts for worship with silent prayer, and then our God will call us into His presence to worship Him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you are able, please rise. Hear your God call you to worship. From Psalm 84, God speaks to us through His Word, and we come into His presence, not presuming to enter by our own, our own uh, uh, demand, but by His invitation, and He is gracious to us. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Let's pray to our God. O Lord our God, we thank you that you have opened a way to you through the Lord Jesus Christ, a way, Lord, through His flesh and through His death, and through His resurrection, that we can come through Christ into Your presence and to dwell with You. Lord, we know that those who have preceded us to glory are already worshiping You forever and ever before Your throne. And Lord, they are dwelling there, uh, Lord, and they will dwell without end. But we, O God, who are yet remain in this world, are called yet to serve You in this life. Uh, Though, Lord, we often can feel so far from You, and we can feel, Lord, so much more uh, tied to this world than to, fit, than, than to be fit for heaven. Yet, God, you give us reminders, and particularly you give us this day as a day to taste heaven. And this time in worship before you as a time to meet with you in a way we, we don't at any other point. When we come into public worship, when you call us into your worship, and we come through Christ, and we come empowered by your Spirit, O oh God, may indeed this be the taste of heaven that we need, that we would be strengthened in our faith, encouraged in your promises, that this day is but a small beginning of what will come in glory. And Lord, yet you also are faithful as our God uh, to provide for us Lord's Day after Lord's Day. You, have yet, you, yet, you yet keep us in this world, O oh God, for there is work for us yet to do, your kingdom yet to be built up, sinners to be called to Christ. And, uh, and, and to be discipled. And we pray, O oh God, that we would be faithful in the work in this world, and yet also that our hearts would long for heaven, and that we would be patient and yet longing for, for Christ to call us home. 
or for Christ to come again. Oh God, we thank you for this time to worship. We praise you for the Holy Spirit, whom you have also poured out upon us another a pledge, O oh God, of your faithful promises. And Lord, the Spirit who dwells in us and draws us near to you this day in the, all of the service, and especially the Word and then the sacraments. We pray for your blessing upon this. We ask, Lord, that you would be at work in any hearts here this morning who have, do not yet confess Jesus Christ, who may be here for, uh, Lord, for, for whatever might have drawn them. And yet, Lord, we pray that this would be the work, your work, that they would be drawn savingly to Jesus Christ, that they would know what it is to have find true rest in Him and to have true hope for eternity. We pray that however we've arrived this morning, whatever we feel, however our week's gone, however tired we may be or, or however encouraged we might be, that we pray that we all would be coming still seeking, realizing, Lord, that, that we can depend on You and that in this time is a time to draw near, even with weak faith, that we might be strengthened and encouraged and helped. So be our help and our guide. Lord, we lift our eyes not to the hills, but to the one who made the hills. We lift our eyes to You through Christ and by the Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let's sing with a petition to our God for even our worship this morning, hymn 538, More About Jesus Would I Know, 538.
Please be seated. It is good when we approach before a holy God who is completely and utterly set apart from us and so far above us, transcendent in glory and perfection, that when we come before Him, we humble ourselves and we confess our sin and we seek His grace in Christ. Uh, this is, uh, a, 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 this is a, a work that we are to do each and every day of our lives in our, uh, in our own devotions with God, is to live a life of repentance. And when we look at ourselves and compare ourselves against our God, we see our sin and we come to Him for forgiveness. And so that's what we'll do as we read His Word, and so we see His perfections and His demands on our life as His people, and, uh, and then we come confessing our sin and, uh, and coming to Christ who will cleanse us from all our sin. And if you're not in Christ this morning, the demands of Christ cannot be fulfilled by yourself. They cannot be obeyed. They are not your way to heaven. They are your way to see your need and to say, Lord, I cannot do this, but give me the grace to do so. Forgive me for my sins and give me grace to obey. So may the Lord add His blessing as we read His Word. Uh, We turn to Mark 12 and hear the summary of the moral law as Jesus gives it, beginning of verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, asked Him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Well, let's consider that demand, the love for God and love for our neighbor, and let's come before our God with humility. O oh, Lord, our God, You have made us. You have made us for Yourself. Yours we are, and Yours we remain. No matter how much we may rebel, no matter how much we may turn away from You, Yet, Lord, because we are created by You, we are still under Your dominion and we are accountable to You. Lord, our natural bent is to think that we are here for ourselves. And it's convenient when we want to remove You from the equation and think that we somehow just happen to be here. And so there is no moral imperative on our lives. There's no moral guidance. We just can live however we feel and do whatever feels good and feels right. And it's selfish. We think, Lord, that We are here to love ourselves and to serve ourselves. Even if we are to acknowledge You, O God, we so often narrowly define our obligation to You, maybe just an hour on Sunday or during certain religious activities that we engage in, but Lord, we confess You are often far from our minds through each day and the various activities we're we're involved in, our vocation or our family, our, our, uh, our, our use of time in whatever way. You too often, O oh God, we confess you are an afterthought in our parenting or in our conflict resolution or in our decisions, big and small. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for not uh, looking to you first in all of these things and through each day keeping our eyes upon you. Teach us, O oh God, to be wholly devoted to you, to offer you our hearts promptly and sincerely each day. We, without Christ, Lord, we know that we cannot love You rightly. We cannot obey this command and do so to the, in its fullness. But, Lord, we need Christ. If we, and if, we do, if any here do not have Christ, Lord, bring them to humble repentance, to recognize their need, and to come and find peace with You through Him. And for all who are in Christ, that we, even as we confess our remaining sin and corruption, that we would still, Lord, again, not resort back to just c- trying... Uh, to try harder by ourselves, but that, Lord, we would fight the flesh in Christ by His strength and through His Spirit. Not only do we need to narrowly define our, our commitments to You, O God, but we also will narrowly define our neighbor and minimize their need or our response. Lord, forgive us for an attitude that wants to be served rather than to serve. Remind us of Jesus and make us like Him 
who came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. Enable us to live according to the commands of Christ, including when He has stated, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Help us, O God, to then love our neighbor with such a generosity, following, Lord, the one who perfectly loved you and his fellow man. Lord, we pray that you would help us to love as you define it, not as we presume to define it. Love is the very definition of your law, O God. And Lord, if we had true love for you and our neighbor, then we would be keeping all of the commandments. So Lord, enable us more and more to be faithful to those things, to be more diligent in those things and more desirous. Uh, Lord, we forgive us as well for defining love, the love that we want from you, the permissive kind that lets us live however we want, the kind of love, Lord, that never says no, the kind of love that gives everything we want and never demands anything in return. Forgive us for defining that kind of love. That's not love. Lord, thank you for your true love that disciplines and corrects us and keeps us faithful. That, Lord, corrects us that we would walk in the good path, that we would walk in, the, in, in true righteousness, that we would do what is genuinely honoring to you and good for us. We know and trust, O oh Lord, even as we confess our sin, that though you punish our transgression with the rod and our iniquity with stripes, yet you will not remove, you will not remove your steadfast love or be false to your faithfulness. You will not violate your covenant or alter the word that has gone forth from your lips. And so we bless you that when you come with a disciplining hand, uh, that, Lord, you are not casting us off, but you are correcting us and seeking to strengthen that relationship. Oh God, we thank you that the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the command, your eternal command, and the gospel which has been made known to all nations, but it, that that preaching has divine power to destroy strongholds. And so we pray that you would destroy sin in us today as your word is preached and give us new victory uh, in Jesus Christ, that we would be uh, Lord, making headway against the enemy. We praise you as well that the, that the cup of the Lord's Supper is the blood of the new covenant, which was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, and that it is in Christ, as you have ordained it and sent him, that it is in Christ that we are forgiven and we are established in our relationship with you. And so we bless you, O God, that, that uh, for that truth and draw, draw us near then in that time of the sacrament and, and increase our love and faithfulness by it as you strengthen our faith. So with these things, O oh God, we confess our sin and we confess Christ as our only hope, as our only Savior, as our only help to live for you. May we, Lord, indeed know his power in our lives more and more, and may we look more like him each and every day. We pray this then in his name. Amen. When we consider the love of God, which enables us to come, uh, to confess our sin and to do so in true hope of forgiveness, we are reminded of His great many promises. But I particularly want to draw your attention to this, the sweet words of Jeremiah 31, verse 3, that is given to God's church, uh, both then and now, and to us as members of His church. He says through the prophet, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. That is the words of God to His church, and His love will never, ever end. Let's give thanks to Him for that. And so, we will sing praise to our God in a moment, but before we do that, let's give our thanks to God through our tithes and offerings, which we'll uh, take up this morning.
Please take your uh, hymnal again, and we'll turn to hymn 637. seated. Let's open God's Word again to Jeremiah. We'll turn first, Jeremiah 8. Jeremiah 8. Uh, we'll read verses 18 to 22, and this is a, um, this is a cry of the prophet after he's bringing messages of judgment against God's rebellious people. It's a cry of the prophet longing for a better day, longing for a day when one will be there who will indeed be the good physician, the great physician to heal the wounds of God's people. And so it relates to our passage in Luke as we look to one who is the one who is the great physician, the one who can heal and through uh, who rolls back the curse of the fall and of sin. And so we're going to consider that with the, uh, the woman who, um, whom Jesus heals after 12 long years of sickness. So let's hear then the prophet Jeremiah before we turn to Dr. Luke. I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? This time we look to Luke 8. We're going to read and consider verses 40 to 48.
Luke 8, verse 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Let's ask our Lord to bless His Word this morning. Lord our God, we need You to speak to us. And as Your servants, we are listening, O oh Lord. We pray, speak into our lives, into our, our, uh, into our hearts, that we would, oh, we would worship You. We would declare Your glory as we hear this passage. And as we also, Lord, would, we pray that we would, our, strength, our faith would be strengthened as we hear of Your tender care, Your might, and Your mercy for, towards this woman, and to know how much You have cared for us. And Lord, so we pray that these words, this passage, indeed by Your Spirit, would resonate in our hearts and would uh, bring uh, strengthened faith or new faith where it is needed. We pray this with confidence in You, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come this morning, we return to the Gospel of Luke, and we pick up here with... Uh, these mighty acts of Jesus. We've been considering, Luke has put four of these in a row, and I think the other gospel writers tend to do this as well. And these, these, these uh, one after another, the Scriptures are declaring a, something about Jesus Christ, declaring His power and identifying Him as more than a man, but as the very Son of God and the Messiah sent by God. We had uh, a, a few verses before this, we, um, we had the, the wind and the waves under the control of Jesus, the storm being stopped, the storm being, uh, being controlled by Christ, and what seemed to be hopeless for the disciples was, was now left them in, in fear of, uh, in, in fear of who, who is this one who is with us in the boat, and then came the, the man who is possessed by demons, who is possessed by a legion of demons, and Jesus cast them out, and the man was made well and became a missionary to his own people there on the Gentile side of Galilee in, in the region of the Gadarenes. Oh, we had two out of the four, and now we come to the last two. And the Gospel, uh, Luke here, and also Matthew and Mark, weave these last two together uh, as, as we hear about this girl who is dying and this woman who was, had been so sick for so long. Now, the first two, if you acknowledge and know with me that those are wonderful miracles and quite powerful demonstrations of Christ, both the, the, the calming of the waves and the storm on the sea and the healing of, and the, the casting out of these demons. And we acknowledge that they tell us something of Jesus and they, they, they glorify Him, but perhaps those two didn't really resonate with you. Perhaps... They just seem a bit distant, where you're like, well, I'm not usually on, you know, the ocean uh, in a storm. And so in some sense, I get some of the application. I see the glory of Christ, but it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't seem like a situation I may find myself in. And, and demon possession, again, it's not something that, that I seem to find myself in or around or seeing that. And so in some ways, perhaps it seems like, what, how does this apply to me? Well, perhaps, perhaps these last two miracles in this quartet of miracles Will, will, uh, will register more, will be more relatable, both uh, long illness and sickness and death, things that, uh, that we certainly 
uh, though we're perhaps maybe not as surrounded by it as we once were, yet are much more relatable to us. And as we consider then what Jesus is going to do, in particular with this woman who was sick for so long, is to ask those same questions that came on the boat. Jesus' question, where is your faith? In whom is your faith? Where is that faith placed? And then for us to also say, who is this? Who is this that has such power, such might, and to come to confess Christ? And this message of hope, again, is a message for you, for your life, and a message to share with others. For again, these are things that others are dealing with, those around us are dealing with day in and day out. So when your troubles are difficult and long, believe on the might and the mercy of Jesus to save you. When your troubles are are difficult and long, believe on the might and the mercy of Jesus to save you. So first we're going to consider the long struggle as we consider this woman uh, with this sickness for 12 years. And then we're going to consider the might of Jesus to save, verses 44 to 46, and then the mercy of Jesus to save in verses 47 and 48. So a long struggle, the might of Jesus to save, and the mercy of Jesus to save. Well, Jesus was on the other side of Galilee. He was on the Gentile side. And you remember what kind of reaction the crowds had there when they realized that their pigs were gone and dead, and they were terrified of Jesus, and they sent Him away. They couldn't get rid of Him fast enough. But as Jesus then obliges, and He leaves that region, and He comes across the other side, there are the crowds, going back into Jewish territory, there we find a different response. There, there's a crowd welcoming Him. They were eagerly looking for Him to come back. Perhaps they didn't really quite know where he went, but now they're thinking, where, you know, we, somebody said, oh, he went across the lake. And they're thinking, well, is he going to come back? And they're looking for him to come back for whatever their, their particular reasons might be, yet it's certainly a much more encouraging uh, reception for Jesus uh, uh, than, than getting kicked out of a territory. And I think there's application here for you and me that, that our own hearts ought to be longing for Jesus to come back. We ought to be looking for Jesus to come back. That same language of them, they, they, they were all waiting for Him is the language that Peter uses as he, uh, as he exhorts us as Christians to look for and long for uh, the, coming of, um, the coming of the Christ. He says, In 2 Peter 3, nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for, that is, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, again, waiting for these things with eagerness, be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless. You and I are called not to look across the water, but to look to the sky, to wait for Christ to come again as He went up into heaven, except this time with glory in, in the, with the holy angels and coming to finish His work and complete it. There's just a small lesson here. It's not the main point of the text, is it? But it is the main, it, there is a point here that when these Jews were looking for Jesus and they had all these mixed up ideas of who the Messiah might be, yet we who know and are taught and have been instructed by God, by His Spirit, are to look with longing and knowledge to heaven. Christ is coming again. Let's wait for Him. We look and we can look with longing. Well, here amongst this crowd, there was, there was uh, somebody who was particularly looking for Jesus to come back, and it was a man named Jairus. And Jairus was a, a ruler of the synagogue. Essentially, he, was like, he would be like an elder, although perhaps maybe even the senior elder uh, on, on the, uh, the, the, the board of elders that would oversee a synagogue. And one with uh, uh, not only great knowledge of the Scriptures, but also somebody who had status in the community. He, was, he would have been known, and he would have had a reputation, and, and, and uh, people would have looked up to him. But Jairus, he's eagerly looking for the coming back of Jesus, and he goes to Jesus, and regardless of what others might think of him, he falls on his knees before Jesus, and he begins to beg him for help. He looks to Jesus as, a, as the one who can give him hope. He's on his knees before him, and he begs him to come, because as we hear, so it's heartbreaking that he has a daughter, an only daughter, Luke tells us, who's 12. Just, just on that verge of, of entering into that, and when that culture would be entering, becoming a, a, a young woman. And here she is dying. She's dying, and he's, he, he, he's, there's nowhere else to go. He comes to Christ, and he, say, he wants him to come help. And Jesus 
graciously begins to move towards, uh, towards the, the home. But it's slow going. The crowd, we're told, is thronging Jesus. That is, literally, they were pressing on Him. This is not a place you wanted to be if you're claustrophobic. They were pressing in on Jesus. We've told this several times in the text, that they're pressing in on Him. So just imagine the, this is like, like an ambulance stuck in a traffic jam trying to get to an emergency. You know, there's a bit of tension there. You're, you're meant to feel the tension of the text. Is He going to make it on time? Time, the talk, clock is ticking. Is He going to get there? Is He going to get there? And then all of a sudden, there's, everything grinds to a halt. Not only are they just moving slow, slowly as this crowd crushes around Jesus, but all of a sudden, something else happens. It's this 12-year-old girl dying, but now there's this, 12, this lady with this 12-year-old sickness who comes to Jesus, kind of comes to Jesus. There's this other need that is woven into the story. And it's very interesting because she's, you know, she's been sick for 12 years. There's, there's, there's some interesting uh, parallels. I think we'll see more of them when we come return to this text in a couple of weeks. But, but uh, there's some interesting parallels that, that the gospel writers draw between this woman and this young girl. Well, this woman had a serious sickness for 12 years. The sickness, we're not told exactly what it is. It's some sort of bleeding disorder. And, uh, and though the, the details, again, the language is pretty, is, is, is pretty vague in some sense, but clearly it's something that would have left her very weak, perhaps slowly dying, um, and, uh, and whatever it was caused. It's interesting that, that the fact that she had been suffering for this as long as that young girl had been alive. One commentator puts it, in the house of Jairus, there had been 12 years of sunshine and song and music and joy, but for this woman, there's 12 years of darkness and of shadow. And not only was there darkness in this woman's life because this was a physical sickness that was lingering and and long and, 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 and just debilitating for a long time, but it was also because this sickness, having a bleeding disorder, would have made her unclean. According to the Old Testament laws, she would have been, uh, she would have been uh, cut off from being able to go to uh, worship God because life is in the blood. And when there is a loss of blood, it is a sign of death, and no death can come into the presence of God. And so, there for her, this was uh, not only a, a physical sickness, but also a spiritual, uh, a spiritual darkness that would have been there for 12 long years, not going to the temple, not going to the synagogue, and not even really being able to be socially involved, because if anybody were to touch her, they would become unclean themselves, and they would be, have to wait a certain period before they could go to the... So she would have been, in some sense, a pariah in the community. And she had sought solutions. She wanted to be healed. She had spent everything she had. Her life was spent on physicians. And here's Dr. Luke telling us this. She had spent her life on physicians, but she was not healed. And Luke actually emphatically, in Greek, a double negative is emphatic. She could, no, nobody could do nothing to heal her. And we hear that in English. That sounds, that's, that kind of makes it opposite. But in Greek, that, that's emphatic. Nobody could do anything. Nobody could do anything. There's Dr. Luke saying, you know, hey, you know, we're, we, we tried our best. They tried our best. Well, physicians then were not, they're not the same as what we think of doctors today. But, but still, it's that sense that there was no help to be found. All had failed her. All had given her some hope, but had not been able to deliver. All had left her penny, hopeless and now penniless to be able to even, to be able to scrape by, still sick, and now with less. You know, in the, in the, in the, in the boat on the water, it was helpless and hope. The disciples were helpless and hopeless. And that man with legion in him was helpless and hopeless, with, with, as if uh, tormented by these demons. And now we come to this woman who, for 12 long years, is helpless and hopeless with her sickness. It's meant to show us. It's meant to, again, bring us, as we have the last few times, to bring us to that point of saying, where's the hope? Where's the help going to come from? She's at the end of the line. What can she do? Well, what did she do? She sought Jesus. She sought Jesus. Here's a physician who isn't going to charge her, though she wasn't quite sure what he would do. But she came to him who freely offers help, who freely offers hope, and could and was not only one who could 
make some vague promises to her. He didn't do that, but he, he was actually able to help her, actually able to heal her. Now, brothers and sisters, when we think about the trials in our lives, you think of the trials in your own life, there is nothing uh, you, you know, you recognize this, there's nothing that says that your trials are going to be short. That's neither a threat that they're going to be long, nor is it, but it does, also doesn't give us, allow us to be presumptuous that they're going to be short and they're going to quickly pass. And we'll just have to kind of ride it out. Well, you know that the, that the length of the trials that you face are God's will in your life for your good as His people. And one of the ways that God works through your trials in your life is to bring you to Jesus, is to bring you to Jesus Christ. Think of this woman. If she had been healed in year one, would she have gone to Jesus? Or year two, or year three, or four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, would she have gone to Jesus? She would have been fine without Him. She didn't need Him then, but now she needs Him. Now she has to come to Him. Now God, through these trials, has brought her to the feet of Jesus, or, well, still behind Jesus, but brought her to Jesus. Would you be as near to Jesus as you are without your trial, if you did not have the trials in your life and the struggles in your life? God uses these things to draw us close to Himself. To be comfortable makes you complacent, but struggles make you seek. To be comfortable makes you complacent, but struggles will make you seek. And you need to seek Jesus in all your struggles. However long, God in His wisdom has determined you will struggle. When your troubles are difficult and long, believe on the might and the mercy of Jesus to save you. This woman sets this example for us. Well, we've seen her need the long struggle, but let's consider now the might of Jesus to save. And this mighty healing, she who, who could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of His garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. stopped. She sought Jesus, but she was scared to seek Jesus. She didn't quite know. It's, he's not going to want to help me probably. Imagine the thoughts in her mind, you know, she's going this way, she's going that way. I'm going to help. He's going to help me. He's not going to help me. I'm gonna, he, maybe he'll have mercy, but wait, I'm unclean. I'm going to make him unclean. He doesn't want to touch me. He doesn't want to be near to me. Here she is already uh, in, in the press of the crowd. She's pushing her way through the crowd. And perhaps some people were thinking, like, Ugh, get away. You're, you're, don't touch me. And here's thinking, oh, he's the great rabbi. He's a great teacher. And he's, he, she clearly believed he had the power of God to be able to help her. But still, would he want to touch? And maybe he's unwilling. She's thinking to herself. Oh, is he willing to help me? Is it, does he, and he's busy. But she was desperate. She needed him. She had nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn. God brings us to that place at times because instead of turning to Jesus, we look elsewhere and we seek other physicians before we finally come to God. And so she, she determines she's behind him. She's like, you know, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm just going to reach out and touch the border of his garment. And it was likely that Jesus was, according to the, the, the requirements of the law, as a, as a man in Israel and as a God-fearing, law-keeping man in Israel, he was wearing a garment with tassels on the bottom of his clothes that were a symbol and are supposed to be a reminder of God's law and a symbol of one who keeps God's law, including remaining clean. Very interesting. And so it's very likely she's looking at him and reaching. I think, well, there it is. He's already, they're already waving kind of as he walks. I'm just going to touch the tassel, little thing hanging down, never going to feel it. He's never going to know it's even here. And she believed, though, that in doing so, she would receive his help. You see, this woman, very interesting, because this woman is very real and I think actually speaks into the reality of our life. She had faith, but it was weak. But she had faith. You see, she, she was weak in her faith, but she still had faith that was still real, it was still there. Your faith may not be strong. Your clinging to Jesus might be just bond, you just feel like you're barely clinging to Jesus, but you have faith and don't stay away from Jesus. Don't think I have to be this, this much faith to, have to see Jesus, even if your faith is just a little bit, you can come to Jesus. And don't stop clinging to Jesus. Don't stop seeking Jesus. As you come to Him in prayer, trust that he will, he, will, he will hear you even if you barely are able. You're filled with doubts. Or as you, as you open His Word, believe His Word, what He says to you. And receive the care of the church as, as those who love you in Christ, that Christ wants to care for you. 
Your faith may not be strong, but thank God you have faith. And the place then is not to go away from God, but to go near to the one who will strengthen your faith. And this woman's faith, though it was weak, it was real, and it was not misplaced. Because she reached out and she touched. And immediately, immediately, she could feel something. She probably had forgotten how it felt to feel whole, to feel, to feel healthy, to feel strong. Right? Maybe that's you this morning. I don't, even know what it, I don't even know what it feels like to not have aches and pains and, so, and troubles and trials. I don't even know what that looks like. But here for this woman in that moment, according to God's perfect plan, at His time for her healing, immediately she was healed. And this is exactly how Luke describes the work of Christ, that when, when God determines to heal, when Christ's power is going to heal, it is immediate. God's timing. This was God's time for her. The purpose in this trial had come to its end, and there was no need for it any longer, and He healed her. Now, let me think with you for a moment. Let me speak to you a little beyond the physical healing that's going on here. I look a bit to the message that is being taught to us, because deeper than the needs, deeper, deeper than our physical need, Deeper than the care of our body is our need for our soul and our spiritual needs. And you may be here this morning, and your soul is troubled, and you're feeling the guilt of your sin on you, and you're not sure where to go, or you're looking and you're thinking, I don't know what my purpose is in this life. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know where I'm headed. I don't really know. All I know is I'm scared. I'm scared of the future. I'm scared, and ultimately, I'm scared of dying. I'm scared of meeting God, because I know, even you know that, you, that God is on the other end of death. And you've been seeking help all sorts of places. You've tried meditation. You've tried yoga. You've tried whatever you've tried. You've tried all sorts of ways. You've tried, you've tried this palm reader. You've tried uh, this philosophy that you've gotten into in reading. And you, you've tried it all. And you, you've maybe even gone into the nihilism and, and just, well, it just nothing matters. Nothing matters, but still there's no peace. There's no peace. It's all false help. These are all false physicians. They will offer you no help and no healing. But the only place to find hope for your hopeless soul is in Jesus Christ. He's the only one who will give you that peace, that rest you need, because He's the only one who can make, bring peace between you and God. And when you come to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the change is immediate. The change is immediate. It doesn't mean you're immediately perfect, but it does mean you're immediately saved. It does mean that you are just, when, when, when you are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, that you are immediately declared righteous by God for Christ's sake, and you are reconciled to the Father, and you are brought into His family, and you are, will never, ever be disowned. That's your hope. If you're not trusting, if you're fearful for the future, if you think, I don't really know if I know Jesus, then the place to go is to go to Jesus and to say, Lord, give me faith to believe in Jesus. Because the healing power of Jesus is not just for the body, it's for the soul, and ultimately it's for the soul. Not only does Jesus have a mighty power to heal, but also there's a mighty knowledge that's expressed here. Because she thought, I could touch him from behind, and then I'm going to get out of here. And so the, suddenly, as she's, you imagine her, she's sneaking away, she's starting to you know, kind of fade back into the crowd, and all of a sudden her heart stops because she hears the words, who touched me? Who touched me? Like, and then she hears Peter. She's thinking, okay, maybe it's all right. Peter's like, Master. I, I, you know, this is Peter. He, he likes jumping to conclusions. I think a lot of us are like Peter. And we're thinking, kind of rolling our eyes, being like, look, everybody. Peter's, Peter's saying, he's pressing in on you. That word that he uses is like, it's like, you're, it's like squeezing. It's the same word used to like squeeze grapes to get the juice out to make wine. And so he's like, yeah, they're pressing in. We're being squeezed like grapes here. Master. Who, you, you ask, who's touching you? Everybody's touching you because everybody's squeezing. Light. And he's like, no, 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 no. And she's thinking, maybe I'm going to get away with it. No. Jesus said, no, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. And then he gives the reason because power has gone out from me. I perceived power going out from me. I know that power has gone out. Now, we can take that too literally, and we ought not to, as if somehow Jesus has like a power tank on him, and suddenly it's like his power is a little bit less now because he's lost some power. That's, that's not, that's, he doesn't need to recharge. This is not what Jesus is trying to get at. What he's just simply saying is that he knows, 
He knows he has healed someone. And in fact, I think the text, I think the text leads us to believe he, he, he knows who it is. He's not asking this question because he doesn't know who it is. But he knows what he's trying to do. He's asking the question in order to draw her out. This is like God in the Garden of Eden coming to meet Adam and Eve, saying, you know, where are you? God knew where they were. But, and he knew what they had done, but he was drawing it out. And in a, in a more, much more positive way, Jesus is asking this question in order to draw her out because she needed to know him. He wanted her to know him. He didn't want her to just, you know, uh, uh, slink off and go away. And still, because her faith was weak, she was still wrestling with doubts and perhaps now feeling guilty. He wanted her to know him, and he also wanted her to recognize that her healing came at a cost. Her healing came at the cost, at the cost that he paid. You know, we think of our sin, and we think that Jesus, you know, he died, we, he, gave a, he paid a great price for the forgiveness of our sins. But you know, that's true, but everything Jesus did cost him. Every work that Jesus did in this world cost him. Because everything Jesus did was to roll back the curse of the fall. It was to roll back the consequences of our sin. That even when He healed people, that came at the cost of the fact that He had to bear our transgressions and the, and, and the, 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 the reason for our sickness and our illness on Himself. He became a curse for us in order to remove the curse from us. I think Matthew, uh, Matthew uh, gives this theological point quite well in Matthew 8. Uh, and he, he kind of um, makes this a bit of a, 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 a descriptive, a side point as he quotes Isaiah. But listen to what he quotes Isaiah. He said, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And what else? That's, that's a quote from Isaiah 53, which speaks of the suffering servant, the suffering of Jesus Christ. By His stripes, we are healed. Not just, not just the soul is healed, but the whole of us is healed. The whole curse is removed because He became a curse for you and for me. Think about that. When you think of your sickness and you wonder what God's purposes and plans are in that, and you wonder about what it would cost God to heal you or cost I think what it cost Jesus to heal you, there are two points to remember from this. One is just as you don't deserve the righteousness of God and the salvation of your soul, you don't deserve the health in your body. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this that in the sense that we ought not to, um, I'm not, uh, that, that we ought not to seek that but that it should humble us, that when we're sick, and you know how, you, you know as well as I do, that when we get sick, even when it's a small sickness, how quickly we can become frustrated, how quickly we can become annoyed, and how quickly we just doubt that any of this is for any good at all. But it ought to humble us. You and I don't deserve our health. Why don't we deserve our health? Because sickness is part of our fallen world. Because sickness is because of sin. And no, uh, sin, our sin does not automatically connect to our sickness, and we don't always make that connection. I I got angry this week, therefore now I have a migraine. That's not how it often works. But, but it's the fact that our fallen world is fallen because of our sin. Our fallen world is, is what it is because of us. Not because of, not because of God, but because of us. And so what this ought to do then is to make, when we're struggling in our health, to humble us before God and to seek from Him the salvation that is offered in Jesus Christ, that all of the curse would be removed from our lives, that we would do it, that it would be done through Jesus Christ. It humbles us to seek Christ. But also the second point to remember is that Jesus Christ died to take away the curse. He gave His life on the, to, He became a curse for us, dying that accursed death on the cross, so you and I could come out from under the curse by faith in Him. This is an application to you when you believe in Jesus Christ. If you're not believing in Jesus Christ, you're saying, God, let your curse rest on me forever and ever. Amen. But when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then that curse is taken and it's placed on Jesus Christ. And thus what that means for you, brothers and sisters, is that your sicknesses are no longer a curse, but you can trust 100% that they will be used to bless your life and bless you for eternity. That is something we cling to by faith. It's hard to hold on to that truth. Uh, in, 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 it's hard to know it by sight when we're dealing with a migraine or we're feeling pain and suffering 
or whatever, whatever our sickness might be. But you can know because Christ has taken the curse from you that your sickness is no longer a curse, but it's used by God for a blessing. And it will not last one moment longer in your life than is necessary for it to be a blessing to you. The moment your sickness would stop being a blessing to your spiritual life, God will take it away. Thus, how can you have hope in your sickness? By faith in Jesus Christ. By faith in Jesus Christ. It's all connected together. When your troubles are difficult and long, believe on the might and mercy of Jesus to save you. Well, we've considered the might of Jesus, which was so clearly on display, but now the mercy. Now the mercy of Jesus to save. This woman there is sitting there, or trying to, is kind of stopped, frozen, heart stopped. She's not sure what to do, and yet she knows she can't go on. She recognizes she's known. She, she, she saw that she wasn't hidden, and so she realized she needs to go before Jesus. But she comes with fear. She comes trembling. She's quaking. Out of, she's scared. What's he going to do? Is it, it, did I steal from him? Or maybe he's angry at me because maybe I've made him unclean now. Or maybe he's just thinking, well, whatever she was thinking, she was terrified. But now she started from behind, but now she's before him. Now she falls on her face before him. And not only before Jesus, but now the entire crowd, everybody's stopped. Now everybody's looking. What's going on? Why are we stopped? And, and everybody's looking at this woman now who's on the ground before Jesus, confessing what she had done. But coming with fear. You know, we can so often approach God, brothers and sisters, with fear and trembling too. Is God going to receive me? Does God really mean what He says He means? Does God, can I really pray to God with such boldness? Can I come to the Lord's Supper in a few moments? But I, I, is He going to want me? Is Jesus really inviting me? Don't impugn the promises of God and His reputation because of your fears. He says what He means, and He means what He says. And if you're in Christ, then all His promises are yes and amen for you. And so you can come to the Lord's Supper. You can pray to God with boldness. You can approach Him in worship. You can come to God. But this, but this woman perhaps is relatable because of that fear. But now she's in front, and now she gives. What a confession she gives. Now she comes. He's drawn her out, and before all the people, she declares what was wrong with her, why she had come to Him, and to the glory and the praise of God, how He had immediately healed her how it had gone away. The problem was addressed and dealt with. What a glorious declaration. And now you and I, in the work that God does in our life, we need to open our mouth and declare the praise of God for what He has done for us. That's one reason why Jesus drew her out, of the, out from her hiding place. But He also drew her out in order to strengthen her, in order to build up her weak faith, because that's what Jesus does, because that's the kind of Savior He is, because He loves her. He drew her out to strengthen her, and he's so tender. She's, she's confessing this, and he can see that she's scared, and he said to her, he said this to no other woman in, in any of his earthly ministry that's recorded for us in the Gospels. He calls her daughter, a tender term, which Jairus, if I say there, maybe getting a little nervous, thinking, yeah, I've got a daughter too. I need, you know, can we move along? We need to go. Uh, but perhaps used intentionally there, but he's saying daughter. He's drawing her to Himself, and He's speaking tenderly to her and caring for her. And He says, be of good cheer. Take heart. Be courageous. Don't be afraid, essentially. Don't be afraid. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, your Savior, always has time for you. He wasn't saying, okay, yeah, I'm glad. Thanks for sharing. Now move on. i got to get going. got stuff to do. got things to do. My schedule's full just like the disciples wanted to do with the children. You know, come on, he's too busy for this. Come on, let's move. We've got a schedule to keep. But he, would, he, he spent time with her. Jesus Christ always has time for you. There may be people in your life who love you dearly but are limited. We're all finite. We all have limits in what we can do and how much time and our own physical abilities and all these other things. But Jesus, Jesus always has time for you. Jesus will never cast you away. He'll never push you away. He'll never say, you know, prayer time was between 7 and 7 and it's 8. And now it's too late and visiting hours are over and uh, come back tomorrow. Jesus always has time for you. That's what he says to this, this, this woman. Yes, Jairus and his daughter, that was urgent. But here, this woman was urgent too. And he loved her. Be of good cheer. And then he says, your faith has made you well. Not that 
her faith had actually healed her, but simply her faith was that instrument by which she did lay hold of Christ. We need faith to lay hold of Christ. We have to lay hold of Him. It was the instrument. He was the one who healed her. But notice here, her faith was weak, but it was faith. And we might say, yeah, well, that sounds really comforting. You tell me my faith is weak, but that's coming from you. No, it's not coming from me. Jesus commended this woman's faith, though it was weak faith. He still commended her faith. He didn't rebuke her and say, come on, get over this. Don't you know who I am? He said, your faith has made you well. He commended her faith. She had come to him. She had clung to him. She'd, she'd, now, now she would cling to him. How gentle Jesus is with our weaknesses. How gentle Jesus is when we are barely able to lift our eyes to Him. How sweet and kind our Savior is for us. The last thing He wants her to know is, well, it wasn't my clothes that saved you. It wasn't your perhaps superstitions that you thought, well, if I just touch His clothes. No, I saved you. I healed you. It was my work in your life. Therefore, daughter, go in peace. Go in peace. Don't worry, don't fear. And this, I think, indicates to us that this healing, and like as Jesus interacted with, with others, was more than just a physical healing. She was a daughter of Abraham who now became a daughter of faith in Abraham's descendant, Jesus. Thus, He could say to her sincerely and fully, go in peace, go and receive, go in wholeness. That's what that word would mean. Go in wholeness, completeness, not just physically but spiritually. Go This is what you hear twice each Lord's Day as we conclude our worship services. Not my words, but God's Word pressed upon you. Go in peace in various ways and and, 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 and various, various parts of Scripture, but yet the benedictions come upon you. God essentially saying to you as you leave from His presence, go in peace. And those truths are to be received by faith. That's not peace that's given to the unbeliever. It's peace that's given to us as His people who receive it by faith and believe it and leave here rejoicing because God has spoken those words to us. And finally, what he's saying to her is, you are, you are clean. You're able to go in wholeness. You're able to go in, full, in, in peace because I'm the mighty Savior. You touched me as an unclean person. You didn't make me unclean. I made you clean. My power is greater than your weakness. In fact, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You've seen my might because you were so weak, but now I can say, go in peace. You've received the mighty mercy from God incarnate. Brothers and sisters, when your troubles are difficult and long, believe on the might and the mercy of Jesus to save you. This is that third hopeless situation that is filled with hope by the great physician. How does it resonate with you this morning? Perhaps it resonates with you because you're struggling in your health. Perhaps it resonates with you because you feel the stigma of sickness and uh, and, and whatever social stigma there might be. Perhaps it resonates with you because you say, my faith is weak. Perhaps it resonates with you for all three. All three are weighing you down. But see, the focus of this text, it's on Jesus, the mighty and the merciful Savior. The mighty and the merciful Savior who is willing and able to deal with all who come to Him. If you have no faith in Jesus Christ this morning, then you need to seek faith from Him. You need to cry out to Him. You may not know what to say, but you can simply go, Lord, give me faith to believe and search His Word and seek Him in the Scriptures and say, Lord, give me faith to believe in Jesus Christ. And if you have weak faith, then come for stronger faith like this woman did here, and Jesus will give it like He gave to this woman here to be strengthened in her faith. We all need our faith to be built up and strengthened. We all struggle with weakness in our faith. And one of the ways God ministers to us is through His Word as as the Word is preached, but also as we come to the Lord's Supper. This is not for those whose faith is at such a high peak of strength that finally you've earned your way. But Christ Himself gives you access because He's mighty and merciful, and He draws you to Himself so that He might strengthen your faith. So prepare your heart. As we conclude this Word, prepare your heart to to participate in the Lord's Supper, to receive the strength He intends to give by His Spirit. Because here, too, we will see and experience the might and the mercy of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we are not worthy to receive such mercy 
and to know such might. But you have given it to us. You are giving that to us, and you are worthy to receive our praise, to receive our worship, to receive our devotion. Thank you for speaking to us through your word this morning and into whatever situations are weighing on the hearts of each one here. Speak with might and mercy to them. Comfort your people, however weak or strong their faith might be, and save the unsaved, that they would come to know Jesus, and thus for the first time and forever come to know hope. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless this sacrament that's coming now, also to strengthen our faith, that we would know your work in us by your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing praise to our God uh, from hymn 468 as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Hymn 468, my faith has found a resting place, and we'll stand to sing.
Well, brothers and sisters, we've heard the amazing mercy of Jesus again and His might to save. And that is, again, that is also what's pictured for us here in the Lord's Supper. As we approach the Lord's Supper, let's hear the words of institution as Paul gave them to us in 1 Corinthians 11. He writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Oh, this is what is portrayed for us in the Lord's Supper. And our, our Lord has already spoken to us today in the words of the gospel. But here in the Lord's Supper, He draws us a picture to show us what He means. He condescends to our weakness, to our childishness, in understanding and faith. In this picture, the bread and the wine that are given are symbols of Christ's broken body and His shed blood on the cross. They do not become His body and blood, but they truly symbolize this. In this meal, we are, have it through this simple means, we as believers remember Christ's death on the cross for our sin and the whole work of salvation that He has completed thus far and will yet complete when He comes again. So as we eat this meal, brothers and sisters, we lay hold of Christ. We lay hold of His work, we lay hold of His promises by faith and are strengthened by the Holy Spirit in our Christian life. It is the Holy Spirit who meets us in this meal, who is sent by Christ to strengthen us and who gives us communion with Him and all the benefits that Christ has earned for us. This is a meal that's meant then to refresh our faith and encourage us to strengthen our weak faith. This is a meal that is for Christians, Christians who are walking faithfully after their Lord and Savior. Thus, this is for those who have both heard and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, publicly profess their faith, and whose lives actively reflect godly living and faithfulness. With this, you must be a committed member of a Bible-believing church under the care of elders that, that may be in this church or may be in another church. But if you can agree to that requirement, that which is, I, I pointed out earlier is laid out in these, those five questions uh, in the bulletin insert, if you can agree in good conscience to those things, uh, then you're welcome to eat and drink with us to remember Christ with us. If you can't affirm this is true of you, then Christ forbids you from coming. The Word does tell us in no uncertain terms that to treat the Lord's Supper lightly is to eat and drink judgment to yourself. And so do not receive the elements, the, bre the bread and the wine, but remain with us and pray for faith and wisdom to move forward so that you would be able to confess Christ and come to His Supper to remedy what needs to be remedied by faith. But for all who are able to come, the call of Christ is come. Even with weak faith, come, forsake the world, forsake your sin, and hold on to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, reminded again by Your Word this day, we come with need. We come needy, weak, helpless, and hopeless in ourselves, but full of hope in You, knowing, Lord, that You are the God whom we need, knowing, Lord, that You are the only one to provide for us forgiveness, reconciliation, holiness, and, and perseverance until we, we enter heaven and then are seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb, then no longer living by faith, strong or weak, but living by sight, seeing our Savior and dwelling with our God. Oh God, we thank You for showing us our need. Uh, we thank You, Lord, that You do this, so that we're not presumptuous to think we're just fine all by ourselves, but that we need You and You will supply that need, and we bless You. We thank You, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world weak Yourself, humbled Yourself, in order that You would accomplish for us what was needed, and now You have been raised in victory and in power. We come to You, Lord, to receive Your strength by Your Spirit. Pray that we would have the faith to receive You well and to be strengthened in our faithfulness to You. Feed our souls, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, that we would be ever more faithful. Sanctify then this bread and the fruit of the vine, which in accordance to Your institution and command, we set apart to this holy use, that they sacramentally would be the body and the blood of Jesus. And help us, Lord, not to look to these earthly things to give us this nourishment that we need, but to look to heaven, where our Lord and Savior is at Your right hand. 
end where uh, we receive. We receive these things then with faith that He will strengthen us. Increase our faith, strengthen our, uh, our trust, grow us together and also as a church as we participate in this together. That we who are committed to you together would be able to participate uh, well, that we'd be bound in unity and one our one Savior, and that we would grow in our love for one another. We commit this to you, Lord, praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask the elders who are serving to come forward. Just one note is for visitors uh, that the uh, the bread that we use is gluten free, and in the middle um, of the the trays uh, is grape juice. Right in the middle section, the rest is uh, is wine. Enter in the Gospel of Luke as we can consider the work of Christ and hear His words from the institution of the Lord's Supper when He ate with His uh, disciples the, 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 in the evening of His betrayal. So while they were eating and eating the Passover, He instituted the Lord's Supper and He took bread and gave thanks and, and He broke it and he, say, he gave it to them and He said, take, uh, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Saying in the Gospel of Luke, let's consider our Savior on the cross and hear that narrative as we consider His sacrifice. As we come in where, in verse, Luke 23, verse 39, and one of the criminals who was hanged, who were hanged with Christ, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was cried in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the Roman centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Brothers and sisters, take and eat in remembrance that Jesus Christ has died for you and feed upon Him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Word of Christ who died and gave His life for us. Let's also remember He is the Lord who is risen and reigning and continues to give us life now. Luke 24, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. 
but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to him, they said to them, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. Brothers and sisters, drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's pray together. Lord our God, we thank you for word and sacrament, a reminder that the blood of Christ was shed for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. What a Savior. He took the curse upon Himself to set us free. What a reminder here, Lord, that that has been done. The work is completed. His, uh, his suffering for us was done and is now being applied, and we bless You for that. We thank You that He rose again, testifying that You have accepted His work, that sin and Satan and the world and death are, are no longer enemies uh, or are no longer enemies. Uh, or, or, or rather, our defeated enemies, or, though, or, or enemies that are, that are uh, conquered by Him, and that we are in Him can have such faith and trust. We thank You for communion that we have with our Savior by the Holy Spirit. We pray to strengthen that then, even from this meal and going forward, and continue to strengthen us as we look to Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves, O God, by faith and in dependence on You, to serve You, to give our lives to You, put away, to continue to put away sin daily through, regular, through, through daily repentance, and Lord, that we, would, we commit ourselves to faithfulness. Help us to that end, Lord, for we are weak in ourselves to do it, but in You we can, and so may that also be strengthened as we've received this meal. We pray, Lord, that You would make all these things an effectual for the edification, the building up of us as Your people and us together as the church. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing 691, it is well with my soul, 691, we'll stand to sing.
After God's blessing, we'll sing uh, hymn 67, verse 3, uh, also printed in your bulletin liturgy. Now, with faith, receive the blessing of your God and go with His peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. 